Uh, so uh, this morning we'll be in Luke chapter 5. We'll be in Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. Luke 5, 27 through 32. And so uh, for those of y'all who are keeping score on the word of the day, we do. I see you there, Merida. Uh, for those of y'all keeping score, so the word of the day today is going to be people. Okay, people is the word of the day. Um, and so last week I had some adults jump in with some not pitiful counts. Uh, adults just don't pay near as good of attention. But uh, there were some okay guesses. Okay, we'll see what happens today. Okay, so let's hear God's word this morning from Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help us this morning, give us grace. Uh, help me as I speak uh, to, to speak clearly to say what needs to be said, and I pray uh, that, Lord, your spirit would be at work in our hearts in ways that um, we would never be able to scheme up on our own. So we just ask you for your help now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> a couple years ago, I was at a networking event uh, here in town, and I was talking to several people. We're standing around a table chit-chatting, getting to know each other, and, uh, and one of the people asked what I did for a living, and I mentioned that I was a pastor, and, uh, and this girl uh, who was in the group uh, I say girl, young lady, she's probably early 30s, laughed, and she said, well, I'm an atheist. Uh, she said, in fact, I tell people that I am Satan's baby. And, uh, and then she hinted around that all the, uh, you know, quote, bad stuff that she had done in her life as though that was going to be, like I was a vampire and she had a crucifix. Like that was going to keep me from talking anymore uh, about uh, this potential Jesus talk. And it actually achieved the opposite reaction uh, I just laughed and said, you are exactly the kind of person that Jesus came for. Uh, I don't think she loved that answer, but to her credit, to her credit, we have had more in-depth spiritual conversations since then, so it didn't, didn't run her off. Uh, as I reflect on that initial conversation and others that I've had like it, it, it seems clear to me, this is kind of my working hypothesis, uh, that most people uh, believe that Christianity is a faith for people who have it all together, okay? Uh, a religion for good people with Jesus standing on the sidelines just kind of cheerleading everything that we do. Uh, if you've ever thought that, maybe you heard somebody say it, or if you've ever thought it yourself, this passage is for you. I mean, this is for you today. Uh, in this short account from Luke's gospel, we are going to see who Jesus came for, and as usual, it defies all expectations and social conventions. I can't wait to walk through this passage with y'all. As I was preparing it this week, I was, I was fired up, and I, there's a lot more I could say today that I'm not going to be able to say for time constraints, but it's going to be fun. Uh, so whether this is your first time reading this text or the hundredth time uh, that you've read it, I guarantee uh, that you need to hear what's going on. There are things you need to think about and things that the Holy Spirit needs to show you about Jesus once again. So let's break it down like this today under just two headings, Levi's call and Levi's party. All right, Levi's call and Levi's party. Let's jump in together. Uh, in 1998, you know, I'm a movie guy, uh, Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker uh, were in this movie together called Rush Hour. Somebody ever see that movie? Yeah. And uh, so these two police officers from two different agencies, so Jackie Chan's from, uh, in the movie, he's, he's from a cop from Hong Kong and Chris Tucker is a cop from L.A., and uh, they're working together to solve a kidnapping. Now, when this movie came out, this is only a few years after uh, the Rodney King beating and the L.A. riots, all right? And so at that point, the Los Angeles Police Department did not have a great reputation. And uh, Tucker, during the movie, Chris Tucker, his character is a detective on that force. He tells Jackie Chan's character, he says, 
I'm LAPD. My old mama is ashamed of me. She tells everybody I'm a drug dealer. Like, that idea of how hated LAPD cops were at that time in history. And if you remember that time, you know that's true. They were constantly on the news for something terrible. My California people are sitting here and they're like, yes, we remember that. Uh, that, that level of vitriol toward those people in that profession, that's pretty much how people in the first century saw tax collectors. Okay? Uh, we've already seen this group show up back in chapter 3. They came out to hear John the Baptist preaching and to be baptized by him. Now, I, I told you a bit about them then, but it bears restating and elaborating just a little bit. Uh, so tax collectors were universally considered thieves because of their tax collection practices, uh, which usually amounted to a shakedown, if not full-blown extortion, and they did all of it with official government sanction. For Jewish tax collectors, the situation, though, was far worse because their fellow Jews saw them as Roman collaborators, nothing more really than blood traitors. That provides the backdrop for what Luke is about to tell us here. Let's look at the first part of verse 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. So Jesus is probably in Capernaum at this point where he's already done a lot of exorcism, teaching, and healing. In fact, he had just finished healing a paralytic. Uh, now he's leaving the house where he's been teaching, and he sees a man named Levi. Now, this Levi is the same person as Matthew, okay? That's the same guy uh, in keeping with common first century Jewish custom. He had two names. They would often have a Greek name and a Jewish name. So Levi, the Jewish name, Matthew, the Greek name. Uh, but because the text here calls him Levi, that's the name I'll generally use this morning, uh, though I can't promise that Matthew is not going to sneak in into my monologue at some point or another. Just know if I say that, I'm talking about the same guy, okay? Levi, Matthew, same guy. Uh, and we learned that Levi is a tax collector. Now, there were at least two levels of tax collector in the Roman system, okay? Uh, and the Greek word here denotes that Matthew was of the lesser stature, of the lesser grade. Uh, he still would have been really wealthy and relatively powerful, but he's not the mob boss that we might envision. Uh, now, we are going to see one of those later in Luke's gospel, but not yet. Uh, so in keeping with his rank, Luke, te uh, Luke tells us that Levi uh, is working in a, quote, tax booth. Now, these tax booths collected what amounted to uh, sort of a toll or a customs duty that people had to pay when they traveled from city to city. So not only is Levi a tax collector, but he is a tax collector that the locals would have seen regularly. Like any time they traveled, they get back in town, they're going to see Levi in the tax booth. You think maybe that he was an unpopular guy around town? Just a little bit. Yeah, me too. And that makes what happens next all the more shocking. Look at the rest of verse 27. And he said to him, follow me. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, uh, that may not move you very much. Uh, it's certainly not shocking, uh, as I said a moment ago. But, but it sure would have been to Luke's readers and even more so to the people who saw this episode unfolding. You have to try to put yourself in their shoes. <clears throat> of all the people, in Capernaum, that Jesus could have called to follow him. Surely he could have come up with somebody better than this guy. There were religious leaders. There were family men. There were solid citizens. There were guys who answered the questions at the synagogue and always seemed to have good Bible-based solutions to life's dilemmas. Instead, Jesus chose Levi. And this wasn't a haphazard choice. Look back at the beginning of verse 27. I want you to see something. It says, after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. So in English, it sounds like Jesus is walking along, minding his own business, and he looks up and says, like, oh, there's a guy in a tax booth. Hey, buddy, won't you come and follow me? That's kind of what it sounds like is going on. That's not what's happening. That's not what's happening. Uh, the Greek word for saw, so you see English where it says saw, S-A-W. So the Greek word behind that is, is a different word for seeing. It's actually the word for to study, 
to observe, to behold, to watch intently. Okay? So he didn't just see him and say, hey, come on. He was watching him. He was studying Levi. He was assessing Levi. Luke's point is clear. Jesus did what he did on purpose. He wanted Levi specifically. But why? Why? Now, we can't answer that question exhaustively, but we can say this. Jesus called Levi to follow him to show the kind of people he came for. To show the kind of people he came for. See, he'd done that with Peter and James and John and Andrew earlier in this chapter. If you were here a few weeks ago, you were here for that. So at that point, he's choosing several guys who weren't qualified by the world's standards. They had no formal religious education. They were roughnecks. They were ordinary guys, the kind of guys who, if they were alive today, would punch the clock at the end of the shift and head to the local watering hole and talk about sports and the weather. And guys who probably didn't spend a ton of time with their noses in books. That's those guys that Jesus chooses to, to follow him, to be his disciples. Now he's doing the same thing here with a man whose morality is so suspect that even Romans who were not known for their moral standards would have looked down on him, would have thought he was scum. And not only is Jesus calling Levi to follow him, but he's calling him right into the middle of his ministry of all the people that are going to follow along behind Jesus during his ministry. Only 12 were officially called to be in his ring of disciples, and Levi was one of them. I wish you could have seen, and I wish I could have seen, I would have paid money to have seen the look on Levi's face when Jesus talked to him. Can you imagine what that must have been like? I mean, when do you think the last time was that any fellow Jew had anything to say to Levi that didn't include a cuss word or an insult? Probably been a long, long time. When do you think was the last time that a rabbi or another religious leader had addressed him directly other than to condemn him and his work? We have no idea what exactly went through his mind in that moment, but his response is clear. Verse 28, and leaving everything, he rose and followed him. It's an amazing scene, almost as amazing as Jesus' calling of Levi in the first place. Now, New Testament scholar Leon Morris says this, quote, this must have meant a considerable sacrifice for tax collectors were normally wealthy. Levi must have been the richest of the apostles. We should not miss the quiet heroism in this. If following Jesus had not worked out for the fishermen, so that's Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they could have returned to their trade without difficulty. But when Levi walked out of his job, he was through. They would surely never have taken back a man who had simply abandoned his tax office. His following of Jesus was a final commitment. So why in the world would Levi have responded like that? Why would he have responded like that? Well, maybe we ought to ask William Borden. William Borden, I've talked about him years and years ago. I looked it up the other day to see when was the last time I'd mentioned him. Fascinating story. In 1904, William, known as Bill, uh, graduated from a Chicago high school and at the age of 16, smart guy, and uh, he was the heir to his family's vast fortune, about $2 billion uh, by today's standard. And as a graduation present, his parents gave him a trip around the world. As a graduation present from high school, O'Brien got some luggage. I'm not jealous. I'm just saying what happened. <clears throat> like I said, Bill was loaded. Uh, well, as he traveled, uh, Bill... Bill, who was a Christian, became more and more burdened for the people that he met uh, and encountered on his voyage, people around the world who had never heard the gospel. And so at one point uh, during the trip, he sent a letter home telling his folks that he wanted to become a missionary. Uh, he believed that Jesus had called him rather than the path that he was looking to go vocationally, that Jesus had called him uh, to that monumental task. And so upon returning home, uh, he enrolled at Yale, with the goal of eventually preaching the gospel among the Kansu Muslim population of China. So during his time in New Haven, 
a uh, bill established the Yale Hope Mission, uh, which was to serve uh, local alcoholics, and he funded much of the construction and programming out of his own fortune. After he graduated from Yale, he went to seminary at Princeton, and upon completing his studies there, he set sail for the Orient. Uh, however, he knew that he was going to be working with this Muslim population in China, and so it would probably be a good idea before going to work among Muslims that he might need to at least have a knowledge of Arabic, because even though these Muslims would not have spoken Arabic, they would have attempted to at least have enough of a handle of it to be able to read the Quran. So he stops in Cairo, Egypt, uh, to, learn, to learn Arabic. Uh, shortly after his arrival, Bill contracted spinal meningitis. And within a month, he was dead at the age of 25. Uh, news of Bill's death was carried in most major American newspapers. His biographer, Mary Taylor, wrote these words in the introduction to her book. She said, quote, A wave of sorrow went round the world. Borden not only gave away his wealth, but himself, in a way so joyous and natural that it seemed a privilege rather than a sacrifice. But after his death, it was found that he had bequeathed uh, something like $800,000, which in today's money, that's about $20 million, uh, to the China Inland Mission, as well as to other Christian causes. Uh, Bill is buried, uh, not in Chicago, but in the American Cemetery in Cairo. And the epitaph on his tombstone reads this. A man in Christ, he arose and forsook all and followed him. Kindly affection with brotherly love, fervent in spirit serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, instant in prayer communicating to the necessity of saints, in honor preferring others. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Of course, Levi's and Bill's stories are very different. Uh, this, story, this call to Levi's, him first coming to follow Jesus, Bill's uh, was more of a vocational calling. Uh, but they share one key element, and it's this. Jesus compelled them to follow. And when he called, they went. For Levi, that day at the tax booth, Jesus' call was irresistible. This man that Levi had never met and, and maybe had not even heard of spoke to him in a way that no one ever had. He didn't berate him. He didn't condemn him. He simply called, and Levi went. It begs the question, uh, for us, as kind of a point of personal application, when, when Jesus calls, and when we hear him in Scripture calling us to trust him, calling us to follow him, uh, whether that's calling us to place our faith in him for our salvation uh, or calling us to trust and obey him in our daily lives, will we follow? Are we going to follow? Jesus calls, Levi goes, but Levi is so excited, he's so overjoyed, he doesn't just go, he throws a party, my kind of guy. That's what we're going to look at now, Levi's party. Uh, when Erica turned 32 or 33, I can't remember when it was, get you know, old and years run together, uh, I decided I was going to throw her uh, a surprise party for her birthday. And uh, so we, we had some friends that lived a couple of blocks away, and they had a big old house. And so uh, we'd set it up where I would go over there that day and spend the day prepping and cooking. And so I spent all day making empanadas and frying plantains and doing all kind of just wild stuff, all kinds of goodies. And uh, that night, a bunch of our friends descended upon uh, our friend's home where we were hosting the party, and we feasted in honor of my bride for hours. Now, as long as there have been people, uh, we've known intuitively that a big party is a great way to honor people that we love. Uh, and often, that party takes the, takes the form of a banquet of a feast. Uh, there is something so visceral, so tangible, uh, so leveling because everyone eats the same way. There's something so powerful about eating together, about digging into a big meal in someone's honor that people don't have to be instructed to do that. In every culture on earth, at every point in history, people have done this very thing as occasion and finances provide. With that in mind, let's look at verse 29. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. 
Uh, Levi is so taken by Jesus that he wants to celebrate him. Notice the text says, and Levi made him a great feast. Now, again, as a tax collector, Levi would have had money. He almost certainly would have had a big house. And it's, it's time for a throwdown. It says a great feast, right? This is a big, big party. But it's not the size of the party. It's not the size of the guest list even that Luke really wants us to pay attention to. It's who comprises the guest list. Look back at the text. A large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. So Levi calls his friends to meet Jesus. Not surprisingly, that includes his fellow tax collectors. I mean, the only people you could probably have a civil conversation with, I guess, if you were a tax collector. And this is, and others uh, who we can guess would fall outside the bounds of polite society. Now, because gated communities were not a thing in the first century, uh, and because much of social life happened in outdoor courtyards or on rooftops, flat rooftops, which were usually only about seven feet or so off the ground, uh, this was not a private affair. Okay, people would have seen this going on. Even if they weren't invited, they would have known, hey, look, tax collector, mug's having a throwdown tonight. Like you can hear the noise and you see all the people, right? They, folks would have known what was going on. It doesn't take long for the religious leaders to take note of what's happening and they are not happy. Nope, not one bit. What a surprise. Verse 30, and the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Now, for this to make sense like it should, there's a word that Luke uses that you need to notice. Look back down at your text. Grumbled, grumbled, okay? That, that is a highly emotive term in Greek, and it's the exact same word that when the, the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew, when it was translated into Greek for the first time several centuries earlier, it's a book known as the Septuagint. We've talked about that before. It's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. When it was translated into Greek, guess what word it was that was used to describe Israel when they complained against God in the wilderness? That word. The exact same word. You see what Luke is saying? Just like when God's people complained against God when he was on the move to rescue them, the people of Israel are doing the exact same thing now in the, in the person of their leaders. Okay, that's what's going on. So that ought to kind of raise our antennas of what's happening here. What are they grumbling about specifically? Uh, Jesus is feasting with, quote, tax collectors and sinners. Now, in that culture, to share a meal with somebody was to embrace them, to welcome them, to accept them. It wasn't simply about ingesting calories at the same time or same place like the food court at the mall or at Costco, okay? This is a deeply communal, heart-level activity. That's why Luke says, if you look at the text, it says they were reclining at table. So at a formal meal <clears throat> in ancient Israelite culture, there would be a, a low table, so it wouldn't be this high. It would be much lower, maybe 18 inches or so off the ground, large square table, maybe rectangular table. Uh, but people, what they would do is their heads would be close to the table, their feet would be away from the table, and they would lean on one elbow on a cushion. And then that, they could use their other arm to reach in and grab, grab food, and they would be close to other people where they could have intimate conversation with one another. So this is a picture of a long, luxuriant, relaxed evening. This is a feast in the truest sense of the word. So by eating and drinking with these people, these people who were the social and moral and religious outcasts, Jesus is accepting them when all the respectable religious leaders wouldn't be caught dead in their presence. See, to accept them, the religious leaders reckoned, uh, was to accept and endorse their lifestyles. They couldn't separate the people who were in need of grace and mercy from their actions, some of which were undoubtedly evil. Jesus' response to the leaders is emphatic. Verse 31, and Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And that makes sense, right? Why do people seek out a doctor? To tell them how great they're feeling. I think they just want to make an appointment and go, hey, doc, I just want to tell you, life is awesome. I feel so good. I think they seek out the doctor to say, hey, look, I just want you to know that treatment you put me on, hey, man, you're getting a five-star rating on health grades. 
just wanted you to know that. I'm sending you a bouquet of flowers later today. Barbecue gift card later today. Think that's why they do it? No, of course not. Healthy people don't need doctors, at least not in the sense of acute need. Sick people do. That's who seeks out a doctor, and those are the people that doctors are called to treat. So while the people sitting around that table that night weren't physically sick, they were spiritually sick. They were far from God. They needed a healer. They needed a physician. Jesus wasn't repulsed by them. They are the reason Jesus came. They're the reason he came. See, his goal wasn't to leave them sick. It was to make them well by calling them to himself. They could find their cure in him. But here's the irony that Luke wants us to see. The religious leaders had the same need as the, quote, tax collectors and sinners. They had the same need. They just didn't see it. See, they thought they were healthy, uh, like the person who has undiagnosed stage 4 cancer but feels healthy as a horse. I've known people like that. You know, I, I didn't feel sick at all, and then I found out two weeks ago I got cancer, and I'm dying. Like, you've probably met people like that. It's the same picture here. They feel great. They think things are wonderful. And so the idea of needing a physician, well, that means nothing to them. Jesus now switches from medical categories to categories that the religious leaders would be even more familiar with, that of, quote, righteous people versus sinners. So verse 32, Jesus goes in the attack again. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus tells the leaders right out of the gate that he's not indifferent to people's sin, right? He's not just hanging out with them, uh, dispensing a life tip here and there, tacitly endorsing their lifestyles, he's calling them to repentance. To repentance. The Greek term behind the English word repentance literally means to turn around. To turn around. He wants them to turn from their sin, from insisting on their own way, from being Lord of their own lives, and turn to him. See, no religious leader could legitimately have accused him of taking sin lightly, though it's something they accuse him of throughout his ministry. Now, I want you to understand how Jesus explains what he's doing, okay? He's not saying here in this text that the religious leaders, or anyone else for that matter, are truly righteous. Now, he's not saying that. He's not saying that. He's talking about people who view themselves as righteous. People who believe they've somehow impressed God and garnered a right standing with him by their good deeds. See, the, the, quote, righteous think they've got it all together, spiritually and morally. So why would they need to repent? When people believe that about themselves, you see, Jesus does them no good. Jesus does them no good. From their angle, they don't need him at all. On the other hand, think about people who know that they are sinners. Don't read that word and think only the worst of the worst. I mean, in this context, it, it, did, it was people who were involved in a lot of illicit activities, okay? But Scripture's clear that everybody's a sinner, no matter who we are. And so Jesus is saying that he came to call those who understand on some level that truth and so know that they do need to turn around, to turn around from living for themselves and relying on their own track record and to turn to God for his grace and for his mercy. And when you start to realize that, even, even if you only realize it just a little bit, because nobody ever realizes it as much as they should, but when you start to realize that, you see Jesus and his message become beautiful and become compelling. See, Jesus is seen here as who he is, the Savior of sinners, the really, really bad ones and the relatively good ones. Those are the people that Jesus came for. Those who know their need and who look to him. But notice this. I want you to, and this is going to become more explicit as we go through Luke. I want you to notice this, though. In telling the religious leaders that he came to call sinners, Jesus is implicitly extending an invitation to the religious leaders, too. Those people who don't see themselves as sinners yet. They too could admit their need for mercy and trust in Jesus 
as well. In fact, we know of several in the Bible who did just that. Guys like Nicodemus over in John's Gospel. Joseph of Arimathea, who, remember, took Jesus down from the cross, and that was the family's tomb that was buried in, was Joseph's. The Apostle Paul. These were men who were from the religious leadership camp and who did come to see their need as well. And that's what you'll see throughout Jesus' ministry. Uh, those who know that they need grace and mercy, man, they flock to him like moths to a flame. While those who are confident in their own righteousness don't, which only, of course, makes sense. Uh, to go back to the medical analogy, people who know they're sick go to the doctor, not those who think they're healthy. I want to wrap up today, try to illustrate this for you with, with um, a story that is near and dear to me. Uh, Erica and Ali's dad, who we called Lito, uh, was for many years what people would describe uh, in American parlance as a self-made man. Uh, an incredibly hard worker, gifted with a brilliant intellect and mind for mathematics. Uh, he pursued a technical education when he was young and then worked up the ranks of Pemex. So Pemex is the Ma Mexican National Oil Company. Uh, in 1980, he brought his family for, uh, over to Texas to grab a piece of the American dream. Uh, throughout most of his life, uh, Lito really had very little regard for religion uh, and certainly not for Jesus. Uh, he dabbled in the Rosicrucian cult uh, as well as other beliefs that sought to belittle a Christian teaching. Uh, and eventually he left all that behind and just settled into being a, quote, good man. Uh, with no real convictions on spiritual matters at all. Uh, you probably could have classified him as a, as a deist. Somebody who would have said, yeah, there's a God, but he's, he's way, way far away and doesn't care about us, uh, despite all the time uh, that his wife and his daughters shared the gospel with him. So when Erica graduated from UT, uh, she went back down to the valley to live and work for several months as we were getting ready to get married. Uh, and during that time, uh, Erica, when she didn't have to work at the hospital overnight, uh, on Sunday mornings, she would drag Lito to church with her, and uh, he would dutifully walk in, uh, sit down in the pew there at First Baptist Church, and go flat asleep. And, uh, and, and, and that happened a lot. It seemed like that's what was happening uh, all the time. Well, fast forward a bit. Uh, it's December of 2000, and Erica and I are back down in the valley for Christmas. And uh, one night, Lito uh, tells Erica, I need to tell you something. Now, when you're an adult and your parent says that to you, what are you thinking? Cancer or like some other kind of like life-threatening illness. And so, of course, that's what Erica's thinking. Uh, instead, he told her, I've become a Christian. Erica was stunned. Lito was 58 at this point and had never given any indication that he was truly considering Christianity. So how, how did this happen? Why? She's asking him all these questions. And he said to her, all my life, I've been able to do everything myself. But I eventually realized that I couldn't do anything about my sin. And that realization turned him straight into the arms of Jesus, who Leto had learned could do something about his sin through his life and his death and his resurrection. In other words, he came to believe the gospel, that Jesus had really lived in his place, had really died for his sin, had really come back to life again to show that the same resurrection life that Jesus has that Leto would one day have. And, G and, and Leto embraced that with all his heart. See, he realized that he was who Jesus came for. He realized that. And so like Levi, all those years ago, he, quote, left everything. Not, not a vocation. Instead, he left something bigger. He left an entire way of living his life. He left his self-righteousness. And listen, this man had a track record. If all you were looking for was like good man points to get you favor with God, he had it hands down. But he knew it wasn't enough. He knew it wouldn't work. He knew that Jesus came to save him, and he believed that. And so he left everything, and he followed Jesus. Beloved, Jesus came for people just like us, just like you, just like me. He's calling us to repent and to trust him. And I pray, I hope that that message encourages your heart today. And like Levi, 
hope that will compel us to bring our friends to meet Jesus as well. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this time once again. Lord, we thank you that you are good, and we thank you that Jesus came for people like us because we sure do need it. We need grace. We need mercy. We need help. Uh, we, we can't stand before you on our own. Uh, we can't make our sins go away. We can't erase the things that we know in our hearts that are wrong. <clears throat> but that's why Jesus came. And so we ask that you would help us today to trust, to hope in the Lord Jesus, even if it's just a little bit of faith, a mustard seed of faith is all it takes because it's not the strength of our faith that saves us, it's the object of our faith. So Lord, help us to look to Jesus today. And we ask you these things in his strong name. Amen.